Hudson and a show that I think you're going to love. And I think you're going to love it from the heart, not from the head, but from the heart where most things come. It's, it's obsequious. It's, it's lagogic. It's, it's humption. It's all kinds of words that I can't quite think of right now because my brain isn't functioning. But this is Mr. Director, and I want you to listen to the weekend showcase because if you don't, there's going to be a monster coming and eat your head. Bye. My name is Don. I go. AJ. Timothy. And we have a full house today because we have a very, very important and special episode today. But first, we have a title sequence. All right. Welcome back to Weekend Showcase. Thanks so much for watching. Tim, it's been a very long time. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Thanks. It's good to be back, too. <laughs> AJ, good to see you again, as always. Same to you, Kaiko. Oh, yeah. All right. So um, I guess let's go ahead and cut right to it. We have an interview episode today. It's been a while since we last uh, did an interview. And uh, this is somebody who is very, very, like, near and dear to all of us who grew up in the 90s. I, I really, I hesitate to provide an introduction, but um, I mean, God, he's a writer and, and actor of like a lot of different um, animated and, uh, and and special like pro special kids and family projects and stuff like that over the course of the 90s. Like God, Animaniacs obviously being one of the biggest ones that's near dear to me. Um, Hysteria, I, I can't even get to it. We'll get into everything over here uh, once we, <laughs> once we the actually excitement. start the interview properly. Yeah, I know. It's the excitement. I'm sorry. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Mr. Paul Rugg. Hello. Hello. How are you? Hi, doing everybody. Good. <laughs> hey, good to see you, Paul. How, how are you doing? Very nice. Very nice. Freakazoid. Not done. Freakazoid. Almost. There. Sorry. Couldn't help myself. Feels good to run around and make my patented whooshing sounds again. How long have I been in that can? It's the year 2020. <gasps> the future? Cool! All right, so let's go ahead and get started. First off, Paul, what are the top three personas or characters that you're known for? Uh, probably Freakazoid would be number one. Um, and then probably the, the two characters I did on Animaniacs. Uh, would be number two, even though those are two characters, Mr. Direct and Mr. Clown. But I think that would be, let's make them a collective two. Uh, the third one, I don't know. I have no, I don't have a clue. Um, uh, 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 my favorite would be uh, out of those three, or uh, Dark Lord Chuckles the Silly Piggy from a show that no one ever saw called Dave yes, the Barbarian. Dave Barbarian. That was my show. You know, my show. And uh, <laughs> he was like, he was like, the Dark Lord Chuckles the Silly Piggy. Blah, blah. <laughs> just, it was so fun to do because uh, we were just playing around. They're like, yeah, I have, I have no notes. So uh, we, I just, I loved to doing that. That character it was fun. Wow. Wow. That, that's yeah. awesome. Uh, Tim? Um, I actually, uh, I just started animation. Pardon me? Sorry. What got you started in animation? Uh, I was doing a, uh, I was in a sketch comedy group uh, in uh, North Hollywood called the Acme Comedy Players. It was me and Adam Krola. I don't know if you guys know Adam Krola, but it was me, Adam Krola, uh, John McCann, uh, and a bunch of other people. And we would put on a show on Friday night and Saturday night. And it was half improv, half sketch. And uh, when they were developing Animaniacs, uh, they were sort of going around to the different clubs because they knew they wanted Animaniacs to have a very sketchy vibe. Um, sketchy not in bad, sketchy as in comedy. Right. Uh, and so, um, and Sherry Stoner, who was uh, one of the, who was a story editor and a co-producer on Tiny Toons, her husband ran our, our Acme comedy players. So anyway, they came and... Um, they were like, hey, do you, we're, we're developing the show. Would you like to maybe write a sample script? And I was a very unemployed actor, newly married. And I was like, well, it beats doing children's parties. So, yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, they gave me a script. They sort of told me about all the characters and, um, and, how, and how to write it because I'd never written animation. Um, and the way Warner Brothers did it at the time was when you write uh, you you are actually kind of directing it on paper, so you t you you tell them where the camera is at all times. Angle on Yakko, widen to reveal Doctor Scratch and Snip, uh, reverse angle on dot, 
and it was the and it kind of was a really difficult way to get going uh, and to sort of figure out how to do it. But anyway, it was a very long winded answer. But um, and I'll go into why that eventually was kind of a really a blessing for Animaniacs. But uh, so that's how I, I got started. I, I wrote a script uh, and they said, hey, you want to join? Uh, do you want to join us on this little journey? And I was like, yes. So um, anyway, that's how I got started. And the rest is history. Wow. Awesome. And, and the rest. It's history. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really fascinating to hear you break down the whole process of what you, what you were describing basically is uh, the stage direction, sort yeah. of, basically. Like how like everything has to be so, so meticulously and specifically choreographed for the purpose right. of not only like those of you who have to help breathe life into these characters, but as far as um, the people who are actually like making the... Uh, like actually animating. In itself, you know, just yeah. make, everything makes sense visually. Yeah, well, it it it's sort of it's weird. It's like nowadays nobody no no studio wants you to write like that because they're like, no, don't worry, you you're just a writer. We'll take it from here. And the way we did it with Animaniacs was as a writer and kind of a performer and a sketch guy is I was able to have my eye on the joke at all times, and and I think that's why. Animaniacs was so much fun to write is uh, the writers were really were able to call the shots. And then it went to a storyboard artist and they sort of interpreted what we meant. Uh, and if something was impossible, they, you know, that they go, you know, I really can't do that. Then it would go to a director. But um, there were so many, <laughs> the writer was sort of guiding the whole process of, look, this is what I need for the joke. Um, and, uh, and it's not done that way anymore, really. Um, it's more like, don't worry, <laughs> you're just a, a writer. We'll take it from here. And uh, but but back then it was like we were in charge of our joke at all times. I feel like circling back to the writing, uh, the, the things aren't really done that way anymore. Sort of portion mm -hmm. of your answer there. I feel like circling back on that in a in a different topic. But uh, we'll we'll circle back around to that. Um, what 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 brought you to Warner Brothers? Uh, that's, that, that was the offer. So they came and saw our show and said, Hey, we have to show Animaniacs. And, uh, and plus I had always been, I mean, I was raised on Looney Tunes. Uh, Daffy, Daffy Duck to me is the world's most perfect character. He's flawed. <laughs> he's egotistical I and mean, he's perfect. And, um, you know, Bugs is great. And, and I, I those, that was my sa Saturday morning anvils popping on people's heads, uh, coyote and Roadrunner. Um, to me, that was just like, yeah, that's great. And I was never so much a Disney kid. Like I was like, oh, you know, Mickey's great, but he's kind of, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but he's kind of dull. Like he's Mickey. And I was more like, man, I want to see someone have something horrible happen to them. Uh, that's just <laughs> kind of the way I was as a child. Yeah. Unfortunately. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. let's, Sorry. Let me, this over to, let me throw this over to Kaiko for the next one. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you touched, I think you touched some points on this next question. And so, and I, I think this is a, something that I personally really wanted to know from you is what is your favorite cartoon of all time? My favorite cartoon? You mean not just what I, I worked, worked on? Um, not, yeah, I, of okay. all time. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is, uh, there is a, uh, there's a Chuck Jones uh, cartoon that he did uh, with Daffy Duck called Duck Amuck. I don't know if you guys have ever seen, seen I it. I Duck Amuck. Yeah. That's yeah. the one with uh, the animator, I think, right? Yes. Like, I yeah. love that yeah. one so much. Yeah. So yeah. I think for me, that's a little piece of perfection because it not only feeds to Daffy's egotism, <laughs> But mm. it feeds into uh, like animation and it's just like it's got everything. So I think my second one would be another Warner Brothers one, which is. Oh, oh, oh just escaped me. But it's the opera. What's uh, opera doc, which is <laughs> yes, kill the rabbit, kill the rabbit. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. So for me, those two are, are just a little piece of perfection. OK. God. Okay. That actually reminds me of the, the duck and muck one. Just like I'm sort of lost in the in remembering that and the one that was. I'm trying to remember if that became right after or right before duck and muck. The the bugs one, rabbit rampage. I think was what that was called. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think uh, I think duck and muck probably came after. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so, but, so you would say that that Daffy Duck is your favorite character? 
Yes, I think yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, be- because he's so flawed. Um, and, and, you know, you can't really write for, well, at least I, I find it real hard to characters that are, it's just go, um, uh, al- although the Warner brothers are the, are the flip of that, like Yakko Aqua Dot are more in the Bugs Bunny mold. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, and Yakko Aqua Dot are going to make someone's life miserable, uh, mm-hmm. for the, mm-hmm. for the six mm-hmm. minutes. So for me. <laughs> For me, someone has to be in pain somewhere in the story. Uh, right, right, right. So now out of everything you have worked on, what is your favorite project? Uh, Freakazoid, I think. Is yes. My favorite. Okay. I All couldn't right. that. I'm so sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting on that. Oh, man. Um, but okay, this is actually more along the lines of Animaniacs, though. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Mr. Director character, you know, he would, he mm-hmm. was basically very heavily influenced by the work of Mr. Jerry Director, Lewis, obviously. Yes. Yeah, um, very, very much. All, almost a direct ripoff of that character, in fact. <laughs> and, that sagacious, gassy man that we all love and know from our heart that comes out of our mouths to give a euphemism of, of, of certain uh, sagacious joy. That's Mr. Director. How uh, about the hell? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It hasn't even, has it been, you can't even tell that it's been 30 years. You can't even tell. No. no. Even tell. <laughs> yeah, I know. My neighbors are like, what the heck's going on in that room up back there? in time. <laughs> yeah. That's um, amazing. But yeah. uh, I was going to ask, what does, what does Freud Laven mean to you? That was one of the big sort of like catchphrase sort of things that Mr. <laughs> Director had. Freud I don't know. So when I, when I was writing it and, and. Because, you know, Jerry, if you've ever... By the way, I adore every Jerry Lewis movie of all time. Um, the Bellhop, uh, Cinderfella. I mean, it, it, but... but um, and uh, wait, what's the one where he works at Paramount Pictures? Um, Aaron Boy. Anyway, um, so if you watch a Jerry Lewis movie, you know, he'll be like, oh, the house and the house, you know, when he gets into a jam. So when I, w- when I was writing Mr. Director and stuff, I, I go, well, I need... I need a placehold. And Freyn Leiven seemed to be like, oh, that's a good word. Freyn Leiven, Freyn Leiven. So I just, I wrote out Freyn Leiven. And then when Tom Ruger, our executive producer, read the script, he goes, yeah, it's great. What is, what's Freyn Leiven? And I was like, it's just, don't worry about it. It's a word. It means nothing. Um, so that's what it is. It means nothing. It's like the points on whose line. They don't mean yeah, anything. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, doesn't matter. It's just a whole lot of now. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, it's like the AJ, comedy wanna... equivalent of scatting. Scatting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, AJ, I want to give you the next one. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see. How would you compare the animation industry now to how things worked in the 90s? Oh, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> you know, it's a different time. And I have to say that Warner Brothers in the 90s was about as good as it gets because um, so we had our executive producer, Steven Spielberg, um, and St- Steven sort of ran interference for us on a lot of stuff. If he if he liked it and he believed in it and, you know, he's he's busy making Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan and, you know, all these, uh, I think J- Jurassic Park, when we were, when we first started, he was already making J- Jurassic Park. So he's busy. Uh, but if he, if he, if he trusted that you guys, you know, that we knew what we were doing, you know, a network person could come in and go, you know, we can't really say this word and we'd go hey steven liked it and they'd go well fine 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 uh so um and back then warner brothers wasn't a profit center Uh, animation was not a profit center it was more of a prestige thing warner brothers always had bugs bunny daffy duck and i don't think they ever made money on it and that was sort of the idea with animaniacs and tiny tunes it would just be this kind of prestige thing with with St- Steven Spielberg. But now, uh, especially since Nickelodeon, not, nothing against Nickelodeon, I've, I've done shows for them, but you have to make money and you have to make a lot of it. And, um, and that puts pressures on storytelling, that puts pressures on, you know, um, 
uh, what the demographics are. If it's, uh, I mean, for, first of all, when you pitch an idea now, it's like they'll, they'll ask you first thing, so who's this for? And the demographics are two to six or five to seven or 10 to 11. Um, so they want you to write to this very specific, narrow uh, band, bandwidth. Um, but when I, when Warner Brothers, again, I hate to say, but Warner Brothers was always about, hey, we welcome all ages, like from the, the three-year-old to the grandpa. Uh, we want everybody to sort of be engaged. And, and that's the biggest difference. Um, and the other di di difference is that uh, back when we would write in Animaniacs or Freakazoid, we would just say, hey, I'm going to write this thing where uh, the Warner Brothers go up against Jerry Lewis. Great, go. And we would go off for a week, or I would go off for a week, and the other writers would be doing other things. We'd come back, and we'd present the script, and they'd go, hey, great, made you baby change this, this, and this, and this. Uh, now, you're asked to write an outline and a premise and five pages of this, and, then, and you have to say exactly what is going to happen. Um, and I find that a really difficult way to write comedy because why not just write the doggone thing? And then, and then, if, you know, um, so th the writing process has changed. Yeah, it's all different. Uh, Warner Brothers in the 90s was a very cool place. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I remember, oh my goodness. I have sort of a follow-up question to that, but you probably, you already answered like one part of it. It's, it's going to be four responses, actually. Um, I remember back in the late 90s, early 2000s, do you remember the, uh, the Warner Backlot the, and one of the buildings the animation division had this gigantic mural. Yes. It was on the back lot of, of Warner Brothers. And this right. mural's gone through a lot of changes over the years. I'm trying to remember. Last I saw, I think they had something about Unikitty on that uh, most recently. Yeah. I don't know what they have on there yes. now. But um, I bring this up because back in the like late 90s, early 2000s, I vividly remember uh, this one mural that they had, which was basically a stylized version of Mount Rushmore with a version of like, with, with different Warner Brothers characters occupying different positions on mm -hmm. this Mount Rushmore, basically. So the backlot yes, mural yes. had, um, if I remember correctly, this it had um, it had Bugs Bunny in the Washington position, Fred Flintstone as Thomas Jefferson, Batman as uh, Roosevelt, and then Scooby Doo was Lincoln. <laughs> right. Yes. 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 And I bring this up because uh, I'm curious to ask you, Paul, like who is on your Mount Rushmore? of cartoon characters. And it sounds based on your previous answers that it sounds like Daffy would be in the Washington position. Yeah, but uh, I'm sure a rock would be falling out of his ear or something. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Daffy, uh, Daffy, Bugs. Um, Scooby-Doo would probably be in there too because he's so iconic and, and um, but who else would be in there? Um, Probably Homer Simpson would be in there as far as a cartoon ca character. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and then I would probably break the rules and add a bunch more characters because there's a lot more rock that we could have, uh, <laughs> that we could make them with. But, uh, right. yeah. Definitely, definitely. And Freakazoid would be in there. Um, yeah, Freakazoid would be in there just because, you know, I'm calling the shots. And so Freakazoid's in there. Russian word you can put it in once. <laughs> no one on the record. Yeah, right. Freakazoid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I have a follow-up question regarding Freakazoid, actually. Um, yep. it's, there's a thing here. I, looked, I actually looked this up. Uh, there's a little bit of information about one very, very vital component to Freakazoid's origin, which has to do with something called the Pinnacle Chip, which was this thing mm -hmm. that... You, you obviously remember the pilot. Like, Dexter Douglas installed that yeah. chip in his computer yep. and then hits this, this combination of keys. His cat hits a combination of keys and then you press this delete and then everything happens. So... The chip allows for true dedicated multitasking, the Pinnacle chip, at 300 megahertz and 16 megabytes of RAM. We're talking about a show that was made in 94, 95, right. roughly. So obviously that's like, you know, bleeding edge technology by 94 and 95 standards. Um, the next question is like, given all of this was like done with extremely dated computers, could, should, and could that IP, hypothetically, uh, Freakazoid, be rebooted for a 2020s audience? I think, I think so. 
uh, yeah, I mean, I would love it to be rebooted. I mean, and they wouldn't even call me because that's the way things are done now. It's like, well, thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to go in a different direction. So, but even if they did, yes, I think it would exist t- today. Um, but I, in, in today's environment, like I saw what they sort of did. I don't know how you feel about it, but, but like Velma is such a disappointment because it, 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 it sort of, you know, it's like they, I think, I think they bent it. So it broke. And I think you, I think you have to sort of be careful with your characters. You don't want to go too far with them. Um, and I just, I would worry that they'd break Freakazoid and it would break my heart. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? But, but, uh, but, you know, if they wanted to, if they just wanted to pick it up and just, all right, let's do it again. You know, let's just keep going with it. Um, that would be cool. But I'm not sure today's audiences would stick around for a show that that is just having a good, good time because everything needs to make sense now. Um, I would love to see things, at least a few shows that just don't necessarily need to make any sense. Um uh, cause I think there's a lot of people out there trying to make too much sense. And I just, I, I think we need to just be stupid. <laughs> stupid is good. No, uh, no I'm kidding. <laughs> so speaking of Freakazoid, uh, you came back for a Teen Titans Go special. How did it feel to get back in the saddle, so to speak, after all these years? It was a lot of fun. I, it, it's weird. It was like, uh, I, I needed to get my voice back together again. And I had just gotten off of three months of doing the show for Disney plus called earth to Ned. And I had blown out my voice. So I sort of sounded like this. So I was <laughs> drinking tea and trying to get to that whole freakazoid sort of uh, sound. Um, but what was really great was the producer of that show was a fan of Freakazoid. So he he didn't he was like, hey, you know, I, I really want Freakazoid to come in. And and um, and he even let me do a pass of the script. He wrote a really great script. But then I, I was like, well, I want to add a few more really dumb things in it. Um, but they were super, super nice. But I think my mo- most favorite thing about that was that they brought Ed Asner back uh, to be Cosgrove and they brought David Warner they uh, they did a link from London for him um, because David Warner and, and Ed Asner are to me, they were the heart and soul of the show. Like they were so much fun. So it, it was great. I've got no complaints. That was a lot of fun. Okay. Rest in peace to both David and Ed. I feel yeah. proud to put in and put that in yes. there. Um, I, I want to bring up uh, circle back to one thing you were talking earlier about the idea of like just it sounds like you just straight up don't trust the 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 steer the current studio system basically to be able to really properly deal with freakazoid in a way that does the ip justice that does the character justice correct yeah me? okay um yeah. hypothetically if they could i'm just curious out of morbid curiosity is there anyone you can think of who you would like to see take on that role hypothetically Boy, I don't, I mean, uh, probably a lot of pe- people, but I don't, I don't really know. And from a selfish point of view, uh, you, uh, you know, well, let me go about to how, how we sort of had to audition it. Because we auditioned a ton of, ton of people. And uh, when we were first developing Freakazoid and the mask had just come out and the mask was crazy and insane. And everybody kept coming in for the Freakazoid audition and everything was absolutely nuts. And we were like, oh, wow, man, we don't really want to want to make that show. Uh, how do we how do how do we talk about that? It's more like conversational and then is weird and then strange. And it and we couldn't really explain it. So. Um, so but I think I think now with all the body of work, the two seasons, only two seasons that that's out there, my hope would be that an actor out there would sort of embrace the normalcy of it uh, until it gets really weird and stuff. So to just keep it like grounded. And I know that's a weird thing to say about, about Freakazoid being grounded, but uh, that's yeah, that sounds Cosgrove like something is- that's more suited to Dexter than Freakazoid. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah, but 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 when you think about, you know, Cosgrove and Freakazoid going to Spamoni Land or the Great Hall of Spackle, oh. uh, those are very kind of calm moments. Um, you know, and when Free- Freakazoid asks Cosgrove, hey, Freakazoid, why you never get married? He goes, well, because I like meat too much. And Freakazoid says, well, you still, you could still be married and have a lot of meat. And Cosgrove going, I didn't know that. 
Um, and just very sort of like we we were just just two friends talking. What they're saying is bizarre, no doubt about it. But th that's sort of what we were doing is sort of like undercutting the joke at all times until we went really crazy. But uh, but yeah. Mm. Um, Kaiko, you have the next one, I think. So I'm really just taking it all in. You, you giving me a lot of food for thought, and I'm, you know, I'm really just, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you, uh, you, you're answering other questions, um, indirectly. You know what I'm saying? So, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> right. So, but the next question I have for you is, um, what kind of important paraphernalia do you own pertaining to your work? Paraphernalia. Uh, boy, you, you know, like men stuff, like, you know, uh, like limited edition, uh, you know, stuff that you'll never see on the market, stuff like, well, that. Hold, hold on. I have something in my drawer here that I keep. Okay. So this to me oh, is. is something is, it looks like nothing, but it is something. This is, uh, David Warner signed this. This is, uh, I, okay. I don't know if you, we did a, um. We did a musical number in Freakazoid, and the thing yeah. goes on for five minutes, and it is pretty much the pinnacle of stupidity. It was like the most fun we ever had. Um, and this is the record script right there. I don't know wow. if you can see it. Hang on, I'm going to it. Hang on. Yeah. Oh, there you go. And I've had this since 1995, and David wow. Warner... David Warner wow. signed it right there, but this is this is the whole musical number. Yo, bonjour, wow. lobby, we bonjour. Anyway, <laughs> this this kind of reminds me that we got away with murder <laughs> yeah. on the show because today, if you went in and go, look, I want to do this five minute of uh, song and dance number based on Hello Dolly, they would say, ah, uh, yeah, no, we're not doing that. Um, and um, and to Steven's credit, Steven Spuber, he's like, yeah, go for it. I don't, that sounds dumb. Let's do that. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, that doesn't really happen any, any, anymore. So, right. yeah. I know you used to write for uh, the TV show Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated. Yes, yes. That used to come on Cartoon Network. Yes. One of my all-time favorite Scooby-Doo incarnations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know it ended in, like, 2013. Do you ever recall if... Uh, there were like plans for a season three before Cartoon Network pulled the plug, or uh, was it just fifty two episodes? You know what? I I uh, uh, Mitch Watson was the producer of that, and um, uh, I think he probably did have a lot more plans. So the way the way we wrote that was it was really interesting. It's like I've, I've never written written that way. Well, Mitch called me and said, "Hey, do I want to?" write a Scooby-Doo. And I was like, you know, I'm not, I don't think that's, I, that's not really in my wheelhouse. He goes, no, 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 trust me. This is going to be fun. So the way Mitch would do it is Mitch had the whole like 10 episodes of where this was going and done back then with car cartoons, you know, it was, um, so he, he knew that, that there was a broader story to it. Um, and the way he would present the story was, uh, he would pretty much say exactly what happened in the episode. All you, all I had to do and all the other writers had to do, whoever was writing one was, oh, okay, now, now make that happen. Um, you know, you can do your own jokes or do whatever or do however comedy you want to do it. But there is a specific arc uh, that we're trying to build to. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It was like surprisingly fun to write on that show. Because um, normally I'm a very painful tortured writer i'm like no it's not right yet but but that was very it was very it was very very fun um yeah so i don't think i answered your question a aj but um if i did thank you for the question <laughs> it, it's um oh sorry i forgot i muted aj hang on there you go go ahead <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say no you definitely did it's just because like Season two, like the final season, it ended with like such a big cliffhanger yeah, right. that you know could have expanded into a much broader story, right. you know. Right. And I just wanted to know, like, was that the case? And you kind of answered it. Yeah, I, I think they would have gone other places with it. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Man. Uh, well, there's always hope, you know, in the age of streaming. I guess <laughs> maybe right. I'm being a little idealistic, opportun uh, optimistic. I should say. I was a fan of that. So, like, especially, God, the way that y'all were able to, like, tell one serialized 
thing, one cohesive thing, which I don't think had ever really been done in the history of that IP no, before hadn't. 2011, before that started. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, that, was, that was incredible work. That you and, guys did. Yeah. and what I liked is it, it took itself kind of ser seriously, which for me made the comedy kind of pop a little bit more like, uh, so that, that's what I really liked about it. It wasn't this overt, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. it, it, mm -hmm. it, it tried as best it could with a talking dog to be serious. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And a talking yeah. owl. That's true. That's right. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kaiko, you have the next one. So, so, you know, speaking on throwbacks and stuff, I don't know how throwback uh, mystery incorporate uh, that's 2013. So, I mean, it's still a throwback, but so do you like the new stuff that is out? Um, you know what? I, I do. Uh, I, 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 I well, well, give me a couple shows and, uh, and I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you one right off the top. There's a show called right. Craig of the Creek. I have not seen it. See, Nef I'm a major it. disappointment to you. I'm a ma <laughs> I don't have Netflix. I don't have Hulu. I don't have, yeah, I'm sorry. That's so just I don't the newest, know. that's the, I'm sorry, that's just the newest cartoon I can think of. Me, What's hmm. the new one? Um, I, 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 I throw another one at you. Uh, uh, um, you, you said something about Unikitty. Do you like Unikitty? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. um, they take a lot of, they take a lot of new aged humor and, 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 and throw, throw it in that mix. So I guess that's what I'm asking. Do you like this, this, this new humor, this new, you know, the, the future of cartoons is, you know. Uh, you know what? Yeah, because I think every, every ge generation sort of has to carve out its own way uh, of telling a story, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I think that's super important. Comedy ev evolves, animation yeah. evolves. Right. Um, what, what I would say that though, what, what has to come with that is someone working on the show that's digging the heck out of what they're doing. And mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, I worked on some DreamWorks projects. I worked on some Nickelodeon's projects uh, where a lot of people were like they were in it because it was a job. Right. right. And so and those shows for me kind of were like, oh, man, this this isn't very fun. This is feels like we're all at the accountant's office. Um, right. And uh, so for me. If someone is loving it and having a great time and 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 doing outlandish things and and whatever, then for me, then they can do whatever they want. So mm -hmm. that, that's a weird answer to your question. But but if they're totally into it, yeah, and they're not doing it because uh, that's what was mandated from the higher ups, then I'm into it. Right. So if the vibe is there, basically. Yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. Okay. Okay. And so. Um, and so you were the voice of Nostradamus on Hysteria. Nostradamus, yes. Yes, sir. Nostradamus, yes. So was it difficult transitioning to working on that show on the heels of Animaniacs, given how the show would sometimes make fun of history very similarly? No, uh, because it was, it, it sort of felt very the same to Animaniacs. Um, so I think when, when Tom Ruger, and by the way, so Tom Ruger, who uh, uh it, for me he gave us animaniacs he gave us tiny tunes he gave mm -hmm. us uh road rovers he gave us hysteria uh, batman the animated series mm -hmm. he was executive producer when we talk about the 90s and we talk about warner brothers that's that's tom ruger we're talking about um it was our and, child, as far as warner brothers is concerned yeah basically. yeah yeah so yeah. so <laughs> and tom tom is an amazing guy so tom tom uh, with his hysteria was trying to fill that niche of what they were calling edutainment, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. it has to educate a little bit and be silly. Um, so he was working on that while I, while I was developing the Daffy Duck uh, primetime show and we were sort of all in the same building. Um, and yeah, it, it was just a natural out outflow of doing more silly things for Tom. So yeah. And Nostradamus was based on the character I used to do on stage called Manny the Uncanny. Um, <laughs> and so for me, it was just like just getting back on the bike and being weird. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I read somewhere that your that your little catchphrase that you did uh, as Nostra, Nostradamus, where uh, sometimes you would tell the audience to shut up. Yes. <laughs> 
Like, that was that... Manny the Uncanny. Yeah, that was Manny the Uncanny. So, so that Manny the Uncanny. Go yeah, uh, so that that's a character I used to do on, on stage, and 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 it was an Im improv bit, and I would come out as Manny the Uncanny, who was he was a Soviet uh, cruise ship entertainer uh, who had just landed in America, and he would do the worst magic you've ever seen. He would do the worst. It was the worst, uh, and. I would come out and the audience and I had this, my hair kind of up in a really weird way. And the audience would start laughing and I would tell them to shut up. I'd go, shut up, please. And uh, that would only make the audience laugh more. Uh, and then I would say, no, shut up. I really mean it. And they would laugh more. So Tom mm -hmm. wanted me to do that whole thing. So wow. shut up. See, I, I, I doubled down on that question because I, I literally will never get another chance to ask this question. <laughs> so Paul, you worked on the TV series versions of Puss in Boots, Kung Fu mm -hmm. Panda and How to Train Your Dragons, sort of mm -hmm. referencing something that you brought up a little bit earlier, how you did a lot of stuff for DreamWorks. Um, yeah. Is there, can you speak very briefly on the process of adapting material for other mediums and effectively finding your voice with it while being faithful to the source material? So D Doug Langdell, uh, The Adventures of Puss in Boots uh, was all Doug and um, he really did a great job of sort of building a world, San Lorenzo. And all I got to do on that show, I didn't have to write anything. I just got to come in and be uh, Artifius and all the um, uh, Artifius, the, uh, the alchemist, the wizard. Oh, oh push. Um, and it was so fun. Doug is a brilliant writer. And those shows for me are so fun. I enjoyed everything about it. And then I got to work with Eric Bowser. I don't know if you guys know Eric Bowser. But yeah, Eric, he's the current Eric, voice of Bugs Bunny, right? He's Bugs Bunny. He's Daffy Duck. He's he's insanely, uh, almost unpleasantly talented. He's so talented, it's crazy. Uh, but he he was the voice match for Antonio Banderas, so he was Puss in Boots in our show, and he's amazing. So working with him was fun, and so that was great. So put that aside, um, uh, Kung Fu Panda I wrote on, and uh, it. it I love Kung Fu Panda. I, I great, great show. I found it really because it's very specific in uh, it's trying to sort of tell a story in a very specific story. And I don't do that well with very specific stories. I like to meander and have a little fun over here. But when you've got 22 minutes and you have to, and it's, it's not like it was with um, uh, Mystery Inc. where that's, I sort of really... I, I, I sort of really loved that experience, uh, but but uh, but Kung Fu Panda was hard to write for for me. Um, I didn't enjoy it as much as other writers, uh, but I loved the show and I love you know what it is. But it was really hard for me. And and to be clear, when you're talking about Kung Fu Panda, you're talking about the Nickelodeon one, Legends of Awesome, yeah, the Amazon, correct, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, and it it was just it's. Um, it, it, it's a very specific writing style. And I guess what it is, is um, it's sort of mis mixing that action with comedy. And for me, with Freakazoid, we mixed action with comedy, but our action was stupid. But in Kung Fu Panda, it had to make sense, right? It, there had to be a real threat. Um, mm -hmm. and, I get, and I would get so many times when I was writing a Kung Fu Panda script, I was like, oh, it'd be funny if this fight devolved into something weird. Uh, but that's not what the show is. The show is let's have a fight. Let's have a kung kung fu fight. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's okay. the answer to the question. It's it's so crazy. Like part of me can only like begin to imagine how like because like having come from all that zany stuff and then having to do something that's as you put it makes sense, you know, and actually has tangible stakes, tangible to a kid audience stakes, you yeah. know, consistently. I mean, it, it, there's nothing, there wasn't a bunch of like creative, creatively stifling sort of like stuff with that, you know, not unlike the, uh, like the way you were describing sort of the studio oversight sort of situation when, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a different, it, it's a different mode. And there are a lot of writers that can actually write that way. Um, I, I'm, I'm too unfocused to stick to a task, uh, mm -hmm. Like, I just, I want to have fun, <laughs> which is not, which is not necessarily always, which is not what it needs to be sometimes. And then sometimes when I try to write hard in sincerity, I just, I'm like, that doesn't, that doesn't work. I mean, I am, I do have a lot of heart. I do have a lot of sincerity, but it doesn't necessarily always come out in my comedy. <laughs> 
Well, it certainly does. We're here to tell you it certainly does come out. Oh. And it certainly has come out in this interview. So That's true. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Um, Tim, I want to give you the next question. Right. Uh, sorry to double back again, but in reference to Animaniacs and Hysteria, were yep. there any time periods or major events before the 90s that y'all that you would have loved to have been able to cover that you didn't get to? Uh, on, hmm, on Hysteria, I'm not sure because I wasn't really writing that. I was just, I just got to come and do uh, Nostradamus. On Animaniacs, I think... Uh, I think for me, I covered as much as I wanted to cover. Um, I, I wrote, I was just trying to count it the other day. I wrote like 45 of those shorts. And, wow. um, and it was a lot of them. I mean, I did the pilot and then I wrote some cr crazy ones. And then I was story editor. So we always punched up uh, jokes and stuff. Um, to be honest with you, had Freakazoid not come along, I had sort of, I thought, done everything I need to do with the Animaniacs and I was looking for something new. So, so I'm not sure that I would have sex because uh, here was the key for me. Uh, Animaniacs, especially, and I mostly wrote for Yaka Waka Dot. Uh, I never knew what was going to happen. And there was this kind of like, wow, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this jam. How am I going to end this? Uh, and then towards the end for me, it occurred to me there was a formula for Yakko Wakko Dot. And the moment I discovered there was a formula for them, it lost its luster. It, it was like, oh, okay, so I could just do that and this. Uh, but back when we were writing Animania, it was like, how am I going to end this? What's going to happen? I have no idea. You know, we need an answer. Uh, that was exciting. And it was enough to sort of get my blood pumping. But um, so, yeah, so... That, I, don't, I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, it, it did. It is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I actually have another question as well. Uh, this is out of curiosity for myself. Uh, it's been a hobby I've been picking up for a while. Um, how would you recommend somebody getting their start into voice acting? Um, well, so the, uh, first of all, uh, a microphone. Like <laughs> you can get a – and I, I'm serious. You'd be surprised. You get a USB microphone for 30 bucks. If you have a closet with clothes in it, that is, I mean, I, I kid you not, I can't tell you how many big time voiceover actors, not me specifically, I'm not big time, but, but like the biggies, they go into their closet with clothes and that is the most beautiful vocal booth you can possibly imagine because the clothes eats up all the sound mm. and it's perfect. Um, so my su suggestion was it would be um, get a microphone, get your laptop, get your headphones, and go to a website run by D. Bradley Baker called So mm. You Want to Be in VoiceOver. And D will sort of take you through exercises. Uh, D's an amazing guy. But, yes. but, but, but it really has to come from you wanting to go in a room. And, and uh, I think D su suggests even that, that you should get Dr. Seuss like Green Eggs and Ham. Go in a room, shut the door, put the headphones on, get the microphone, and read Green, Egg, Green Eggs and Ham in different voices, in different emotions, in different attitudes. Um, you really, you got to start somewhere, right? right. Um, and, and so that would be my way of doing it. See, I never set out to be in voiceover. I, I liked comedy and sketch comedy and being in front of an audience. Um, and it was only when, when Tom Ruger said, hey, you're going to be Jerry Lewis. We want you to be the guy, and you're going to go in there. That was the first time I ever did voiceover. Um, and, and so, um, and then I got lucky enough to do Freakazoid and, and little incidental things here and there. And then pretty soon, you know, they're like, hey, you want to do this character and that character. Um, but if you look at Rob Paulson, uh, Maurice LaMarche, Jess Harnell, Tress McNeil, Eric Bowser, um, a lot of people, and it was, it was me, when I'm watching Eric Bowser work, I realize how seriously he takes it mm -hmm. and how, you know, there's a way to read that line. There's a way to put the emphasis on this word over here. There's a way to phrase it. And he's working. He's acting. He's doing it. So I would suggest if you want to be in voiceover, get into an improv class. 
get into an acting class because it's not always about the wonderful, you know, it's not about this microphone a lot. <laughs> Sometimes it's just about acting, acting. Because mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, I mean, I mean you know them. I, know them. I can do 40 different voices. Awesome. But can you read copy and act? Can mm -hmm. you, right. can you, you know, so, um, so my suggestion is get a microphone, get Dr. Seuss, get what, look at D. Bradley Baker's site, uh, mm -hmm. join an improv group, join an acting group, um, and start. Yeah. Um, oh, well, I know you're still doing the, um, are you still doing like any conventions or stuff like that? Do you have any upcoming like con ex uh, experiences? Uh, yeah, I will be, I believe, uh, Tom Rook and I have another con we join, um, and I do that with Tom some sometimes. But I'll be in Savannah at the uh, at the in Savannah at the uh, con. I don't know what it's called, but uh, we're going to talk about Freakazoid and Animaniacs, and it'll be wonderful, and everyone should come. Mm -hmm. There you go. See, see, see. Okay. See how I did that? I there just <laughs> I just did that. There you go. Boom. It looks like it looks like Savannah Comic Con, just straight up Savannah Comic Con. Yeah, I think so. Or a superstar uh, comic con. Does that sound right? No, no. Hold on. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm looking it up. I'm looking it up. Okay. It's about to. Uh, let's get this right. We, we can do this. Yeah, let's do this. get this right. I can do this. It is the Savannah Comic Con. There it is. Hey, uh, right. okay. <laughs> September 23rd, 24th in Savannah. Okay. Oh, and then Fair, Fairfax Count Comic Con, uh, August 26th, 27th. Fairfax. Okay. So, no. right. so come to those. And hear all about Animaniacs. All right. <laughs> Freakazoid. All right. All right. All right. Tickets I guess on that's... sale now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Kids right. five bucks. Thanks. Thanks so much, Paul, for spending the hour with us. We really appreciate okay, it. Okay, guys. And obviously, you're welcome. Thanks so anytime. much. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I just, I can't believe we nailed this interview. I can't that's believe fun. it either, honestly. Like, I'm <laughs> so into okay. everything in my power to just keep it together for the entire right. hour. And now we are at the end of our show, so that means once again it's time for dad joke of the day. I've got the, the I've got my tablet with all the dad jokes, and yes, Kaiko, you have the butterfly net. I trust. <laughs> it's in hand. What have yeah. I missed? All right. <laughs> so much. So much. All right. Here we are. Dad joke of the day. What brand of underwear do scientists wear? You got what? Me. Boxers. What? But. <laughs> What no, brand I know this. Oh wait, brand. I, was, I would say athletes, actually, AJ. That would work for athletes, maybe. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. What brand of underwear do scientists wear? The answer is Kelvin uh, Klein. That's not terrible. That's terrible. Go ahead, and, go ahead and let me go. Ahead. But see, but see, we're gonna release. We also gonna release this guy. But see, got, it's more of a weatherman joke at that. We're gonna release no, this little guy. I, here. I got it, and I hate it that I got it. <laughs> And that's a wrap for this very special interview episode of Weekend Showcase. Thank you so much at home for watching or listening in. And a very special thanks to our special guest, Mr. Paul Rugg. You can visit him at the Fairfax Comic Con in August 26th and 27th at the Dulles Expo Center in Chantilly, Virginia. And at the Savannah Comic Con in September. So my name is Don. With me tonight were... I'm Kaiko. AJ. And Timothy. All right. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next time. Don't forget to like, follow, share, and subscribe. And um, visit us at the Linktree page at the bottom of your screen for uh, all of our other awesome content. And for the contact form if you want to suggest game streams or weird news articles that we can talk about on the show. For now, have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.